Imagine this. The world has ended. A catastrophe, nuclear war, climate collapse, or something unimaginable has swept away billions of lives. And now, only two people remain. A man. A woman. Survivors. They look at the silent earth and realize they carry the last spark of human existence. But could they really bring humanity back? Could the entire human story, with its languages, cultures, and billions of unique individuals, be reborn from just this fragile pair? Today, we journey into one of the most haunting questions of survival. Through science, through history, through philosophy, we will uncover the truth. History is filled with small groups who dared to start over. Some survived, others collapsed. In 1790, nine mutineers from the HMS Bounty, along with a handful of Polynesians, fled to Pitcairn Island. They built a new life far from the world. Children were born, families grew. But as the generations passed, something darker emerged. With such a limited gene pool, illnesses spread. Some descendants suffered from hemophilia, seizures, and depression. Their story teaches us something vital. When humanity shrinks, biology takes its toll. But Pitcairn wasn't alone. Across the globe, tiny founding populations have left genetic footprints, sometimes tragic, sometimes astonishing. Now, imagine shrinking that number down to just two. Can humanity begin again? or would it be doomed before it starts? Genes are like tools in a toolbox. The more tools you have, the better you can repair what breaks. Lose too many tools, and even the smallest crack can destroy the entire structure. This is the danger of starting with too few people. Take the Habsburg dynasty of Europe. Centuries of royal inbreeding, marrying cousins to keep blood pure, led to devastating results. The most infamous case was Charles II of Spain. His face was deformed, his jaw protruding, his body frail. He could not produce children. Doctors wrote that his body was the product of generations of incest. His death ended the Spanish Habsburg line. This was not myth. It was history. A dynasty destroyed by its own shrinking genetic pool. Why does this happen? Because in small groups, Harmful recessive genes, which normally stay hidden, begin to pair up. When cousins or siblings reproduce, the odds of both parents carrying the same harmful gene rise dramatically. That's why diseases like hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, or certain deformities become common in inbred populations. It's not just about surviving. It's about surviving well. Now, let's cross the sea to Tristan de Cunha, a lonely island in the South Atlantic. Settled by just a few families in the 1800s, it grew into a community of a few hundred. But today, nearly all Tristan Islanders carry the same handful of surnames. And with such limited ancestry, asthma and glaucoma are unusually common. On Norfolk Island, descendants of the bounty settlers share a similar fate, higher rates of migraines, depression, and genetic illness even larger groups struggle. The Amish in America, descended from a few 18th century families, have unusually high rates of rare diseases like maple syrup urine disorder. The Ashkenazi Jews, who endured population bottlenecks centuries ago, face higher risks of Tay-Sachs and other inherited illnesses. All of these groups remind us, the smaller the starting point, the heavier the genetic burden. Now imagine only two. Nature offers even starker warnings. Cheetahs nearly went extinct 100,000 years ago. Today, almost every cheetah alive is like a sibling to another, genetically near identical. The result? They struggle to fight off disease, and many suffer from fertility issues. Or take bananas. The Cavendish banana, the one most of us eat, is a clone. Each plant is genetically identical. That's why a single fungus, Panama disease, now threatens to wipe them out completely. <laughs> Humanity, starting from just two people, risks becoming the same, fragile, uniform, and vulnerable. Population geneticists like Douglas Futuima suggest that to avoid collapse, at least several hundred individuals are needed. 
not two, not 10. The Florida Panther is proof. In the 1990s, only 30 remained. They developed heart defects, kinked tails, and low fertility. Only by introducing new panthers from Texas did scientists save them. Without diversity, survival becomes impossible. Two humans alone cannot rebuild a healthy species. The math and biology make it clear. But science is only half the story. Let's imagine it's you, you and one other survivor. Would you try? Would you risk creating children knowing they might suffer? This is where philosophy enters. Children cannot consent to their own birth. If two survivors choose to rebuild, they are deciding for generations to come. History has shown us the danger of ignoring this. The eugenics movement of the early 20th century believed humanity could be improved by controlling who reproduced. The result was forced sterilizations, discrimination, and immense suffering. Trying to save humanity from just two survivors risks repeating such ethical blind spots. Existentialists like Camus remind us, survival alone is not enough. If life is doomed to suffering, what then is the purpose of continuing? Is it better to let humanity die with dignity or rebuild, knowing collapse may follow? But perhaps we are asking the wrong question. Is humanity only DNA? Psychologists like Steven Pinker argue that our true inheritance lies in language, culture, and knowledge. Consider the Maori of New Zealand. In the 19th century, disease and war nearly erased them. Yet through determination and cultural revival, they survived not just biologically, but spiritually. So if two survivors remained, their greatest task may not be reproduction. It may be to carry stories, knowledge, and meaning forward. Because even if genes fail, culture can outlast extinction. We live in an age of possibilities. Today we have CRISPR gene editing, artificial wombs, frozen embryos, DNA banks, if only two people survived, technology might become their lifeline, introducing diversity artificially, preventing collapse. And beyond biology, we now have AI. Imagine survivors raising children not alone, but with libraries of knowledge, music, history, all preserved by artificial intelligence. Even if flesh is fragile, memory may endure. Perhaps humanity's true survival will not be in bodies, but in ideas. So, can two people really rebuild humanity? Science tells us no. Biology collapses without diversity. Ethics warns us of suffering. But philosophy offers something deeper. That humanity is not just in our genes, but in our minds, our stories, and our spirit. Maybe the real question is not whether we can restart humanity, but whether we should. And if that day ever comes, perhaps the legacy we leave behind, our art, our culture, our wisdom, will matter more than our DNA ever could. This is Solith. Thank you for listening, reflecting, and questioning with me.